Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Camara. Uh, we'll give a couple minutes for people to come in and then we'll get started. All right, so it looks like the inflow of people has slowed. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is Mike Camara. I'm with Bogart Wealth. Thank you so much for attending this seminar. This is gonna be focused around net unrealized appreciation or NUA for short and some other post-retirement strategies. Oops. So just to get started a little bit about us, um, we are a RIA. We have about 2.1 billion of assets under advisement. We work with over a thousand different households. Um, as an RIA, we have a fiduciary legal responsibility to work as a fiduciary. We're independent. Uh, we custody with Charles Schwab, so no money is held directly at Bogart. And uh, a lot of experience here. I've been doing this for 18 years, certified financial planner. And uh, we are a fee-only wealth management firm, no commissions, incentives, or conflict of interest. These are our advisors. There's James Bogart, the head of the company. Again, there I am, and the rest of our team as of advisors. We have our operations and planning team. All of our associates and employees, you can go to our website and read up on anybody's file there. We have also added some people. This is our portfolio management and tax team. And pretty much what we like to focus on is overall comprehensive and holistic planning. So a lot of things that we like to focus on, uh, retirement analysis is usually where we'd like to begin, then putting together cash flow and withdrawal strategies, tax planning and optimization, investment management, estate planning, and then we monitor and review. You'll notice that this is a continuous circle. So we treat retirement planning as something that's never done. We have three office locations. I'm in the Woodlands office, Woodlands, Texas. We have a downtown Houston office and then McLean, Virginia. We invite you to take us up on a complimentary one-on-one -on -one financial uh, session. A lot of times we use this as an opportunity to get to know people, um, see if we'd be a good fit for you. You'd be a good fit for us as clients. Uh, no commitment. We do a lot of uh, complimentary work on the front end. If you decide to go a different route, only thing we ask is just to tell your friends. We grow primarily off of word of mouth. So let's go ahead and get started on the topic at hand, which is NUA. Uh, before we get into what NUA itself is, let's set the stage a little bit to talk about um, a couple items that are key to understand as far as types of accounts. And what we first want to focus on is qualified plans or 401ks, retirement accounts. There's a lot of different things you can, uh, ways you can call these. But a 401k plan, there's some good and bad or some good in other parts to that. First of all, when it comes to a 401k, salaries are contributed on a pre-tax basis. Taxes are reduced while you're saving. So basically, if you're putting 7% into a 401k plan, that comes off your gross pay and you thus have less income tax you have to worry about for that year. There's no taxes on any appreciation. The only time you pay taxes on it is when you withdraw money. There's no taxes on dividends either. Usually you'll receive company match. And then there's the other part. There's a 10% early withdrawal penalty if you draw from a retirement account, be it a 401k, IRA, or otherwise, under the age of 59 and a half. There are some exceptions to that. Get into that a little bit later. Every dollar is taxed as ordinary income. And you have to take out every dollar while alive. What that basically means is that once you reach the age of either 73 or 75, depending on how old you are, you have to start taking what's called required minimum distributions. And the government enforces this. 
required minimum distributions have a big tax penalty if you don't withdraw that based on your age. Again, 75 for a lot of people, 73 for some as well. Then there are what are called non-qualified accounts. So think of these as non-retirement accounts, um, brokerage accounts, checking savings accounts. These are monies that are after tax. So there's no such thing as early withdrawals. You can take the money out at any time. No such thing as required minimum distributions. Appreciation is taxed as capital gains. If you hold a security or a position or a stock for more than a year, you'll be looking at long-term capital gains as opposed to short-term capital gains if a gain is sold or realized within a year. Long-term capital gains rates are typically 40% lower than ordinary income rates. But then there's also the other part. All investments, again, are on an after-tax basis. So it's not really going to save you on taxes by putting money into a after-tax or non-qualified account. You pay more taxes every year because even if you're not using the money, you have to pay taxes on dividends, interest, capital gains. In tax parlance, the gain when realized is realized even if you don't withdraw the cash as mentioned. And if you're putting money into an after-tax account, typically you're not receiving any company match. So a lot of times because of the company match, saving in a 401k plan, not only for the tax savings is good to do because many companies give you free money if you put money away into your 401k. So what is NUA? <clears throat> NUA basically allows for a do-over. It allows you to move money from a qualified plan, again, think 401k retirement account to a non-qualified plan. Think brokerage account, non-retirement account. This only applies to employer stock in a 401k. It does not apply to anything else. However, the employer stock can also be in the form of match, meaning that if you had company match go into your 401k and it bought company stock, that can still be part of this. Um, also, one quick sidebar, I have the uh, chat open. So any questions, feel free to type it into the chat here. Um, you can choose which dollar range of shares you want to declare NUA on. And we'll get into exactly, again, what NUA is. That must be part of a lump sum distribution from a 401k. So what that means is if you do declare NUA or decide to use this strategy, your entire 401k has to come out within a year of declaring NUA. I'm going to emphasize that a couple of times because that's very important. So there has to be a qualifying event in order to be able to declare NUA. A qualifying event can be separation from service after the age of 55, attaining age 59 and a half, unfortunately becoming disabled. Those are three of the main ones. You have to, again, remove everything from the 401k. Anything that you do not take as NUA can be rolled over to an IRA. So any non-NUA assets, you can move over to an IRA and there won't be any taxes by moving that money from a 401k to an IRA. But again, nothing can be left in the 401k at the end of the calendar year. You'll see us emphasize that a number of times because if there is still money at the end of the calendar year, the government can come in and basically negate everything you've done with NUA. You could have a big, serious tax issue if that's the case. So why is it called NUA? <clears throat> NUA, by definition, is the current stock value minus the cost basis or what you paid for the stock. So the tax benefit for the, when you're looking at NUA on whether it makes sense for you, the tax benefit is going to be if you have a low enough cost basis and a high enough value at the time of declaring NUA. Again, we'll get into that here a little bit more in detail. So this is getting into, I, th I think this slide illustrates, you know, more than anything, what NUA is and what the benefit is. So on the left here is not doing NUA. Let's call it the base case. If you don't do NUA and you sell some of your Exxon stock, take it out of the 401k or take it out of the IRA, 100% of what you take out is taxed as ordinary income. What NUA allows you to do is have the gains on the stock taxed at long-term capital gains rates. Your cost basis, meaning what you bought the stock at, is still going to be taxed as ordinary income. However, the gains can be taxed at long-term capital gains rates. And as we mentioned before, 
long-term capital gains rates can have significant savings as far as how much you owe in taxes. So here's a dollar amount example. Let's say you have $500,000, you take it out of a 401k or an IRA, all $500,000 is taxed as ordinary income. If you declare NUA, and let's say your cost basis is $50,000, that would still be taxed as ordinary income. But let's say you had a gain of $450,000, that $450,000 worth of gain can be taxed at long-term capital gains rates. So here's a breakdown of the difference between ordinary income rates and capital gains rates. In some cases, if you have no other income, you can have capital gains rates that are not even taxed. Oh, I got a question. Uh, if I'm buying stock on an after-tax basis inside my 401k, do those shares qualify for NUA? No. NUA only applies to shares that are bought on a pre-tax basis. <laughs> Good question, though. Uh, so as we're looking at the difference in income rates on the low end or the high end, you can see the capital gains rates are significantly less than ordinary income rates. So when you declare NUA, as mentioned, you have to move everything out of your savings plan. And I have a, another illustration around this, but typically what we do is move everything over that's not NUA into an IRA. And then what is NUA or your NUA shares, think of it as your Exxon shares that you've declared NUA on, those get moved over into a non-retirement account can be set up as a joint account, an individual account, or even a trust. So the qualifications, this is only allowed, to, you're only allowed to use NUA <clears throat> uh, with tax rules if you receive the employer securities as part of a lump sum distribution, meaning that there's only a one-shot deal. You can't say, I'm gonna do a little bit of NUA this year, do some more NUA next year, and then the year after that, you get one shot, you can't, there's no do-overs, things like that. So basically, again, the entire balance has to be paid out within a single year. Whatever price point you do NUA at, and you're stuck with it after you've declared it. It must be the first distribution after you reach age 59 and a half or as a result of your separation from service after 55, disability or death. Let me talk a little bit more to that. So the main thing you want, want to focus on is that if you take money out of your 401k, <clears throat> and you do not declare any way, let's say you retire, you know, this year, you take money out of the 401k, you just take $10,000 out, and you're already 59 and a half. If you then do not declare any way and take everything out this year, you are not going to be able to do any way the year after or the year after that. Basically, you have to, if you take any money out of the 401k, everything's got to come out that year in order to declare any way taking money out and then deferring, taking out all of the 401k, basically after a year, negates NUA unless you have a qualifying event. Meaning that if you leave the company at 55 or 56 and you take a withdrawal, keep the money in there, don't do NUA, you have another shot to do it at 59 and a half. And let me also emphasize that this has a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of nuances to this. So this is probably one of the most complex retirement uh, topics that we discuss. Again, feel free to, you know, pop in any calendars. Um, rolling 12, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I just saw that question there, rolling 12. All right, so this is an example of the Exxon uh, statement. So as we've mentioned, this is all pertaining to your employer's stock here. Nothing else qualifies for NUA, and that's with any 401k plan. It's only employer stock. Nothing with the equity units, extended market, bond units, balance units, or common assets. So after-tax money in an account plays into the NUA strategy. And so the one thing to kind of emphasize when it comes to reading your statement with after-tax money, a lot of people look at this column here or this section here where it says after-tax account, and you can see it has a balance of 562756 and some change. That is not really the after-tax account or the after-tax balance. That's the after-tax balance plus earnings. This section here where it says pre-87, post-86 contributions, this is truly what is the after-tax money or post-tax money that is in the VOIA plan. 
the delta or the difference between this about 273,000, 274,000, and this about 562,000, the difference is what that after-tax money has grown to. That growth is considered pre-tax money. So anything that that after-tax money earns or gains is considered pre-tax. And so that's what this 562 is. It's the basis plus the gains. So you have some options when it comes to that after-tax money. And again, coming back to this, that's only going to be this money, not this 562. So the options you have with your after-tax money are to withdraw it. You've already paid taxes on it. So if you took out the $270,000, you can withdraw it. There won't be any additional taxes on that because it's already been taxed. Another option is to roll it into a Roth IRA. This is a new option as of 2015. Great option as well um, if you don't have NUA definitely would be something to consider. And that can be better than um, NUA if you're not selling any Exxon stock, because if you move that after-tax money into a Roth IRA, any growth it has from there is going to be tax-free as long as it's been in there for five years and you're past the age of 59 and a half. So coming back to this example again, if all of this growth had been, or if all of this had been in a Roth and it grew to 562, that entire 562 would be tax-free in a Roth as long as you meet the criteria of reaching the age of five, 59 and a half, and again, having made your first contribution at least five years ago. But a third option with the after-tax money, and what we like to consider doing, is applying it to the cost basis of your NUA shares. This is a way to leverage that after-tax money. I'll explain why that's important and why you, know, you may want to consider doing that here in just a second. So once again, when you're reading your statement, um, this is using the VOIA example. The nice thing about VOIA, and this is somewhat rare in 401k land, VOIA keeps track of every single share of Exxon that you've ever bought, and more importantly, how much you paid for it. So if you have some time, pull up a year-to-date statement, scroll all the way to, I think it's maybe page four, five, or six, and you'll start seeing your stock cost basis by dollar range. And you can see the number of shares you have and what you paid for them. A little sidebar here. This is where you can see how much you're saving. If you're saving on a pre-tax, after-tax, there'll also be a Roth option in here as well. Catch up contributions. And then this shows where your money is being invested. Is your money being invested in Exxon stock? In this case, no. 30% is going to the equity units. 25% here is going to extended. 30% to international and 15% to bonds. So that's just where your payroll deductions go. So this gives a further illustration of, oh, sorry. I got another question. To be clear, does any way only apply to Exxon Mobil stock or other assets as well? Just Exxon Mobil stock in a 401k plan. So not with Exxon Mobil stock in an IRA. Um, so just Exxon Mobil stock in a 401k plan. But it can also be if you work for another company, like you work for JP Morgan Chase and you have, you know, JP Morgan Chase stock in your 401k plan, NUA can be utilized for that as well. So it's basically your current employer's stock in your current employer's 401k. And that can be any company. But in this case, we use Exxon. All righty. So <clears throat> this is another savings plan illustration on kind of how the savings plan is fully distributed. So basically you have money that can go to a, uh, if you have a Roth 401k, that typically or usually always goes to a Roth IRA. If you have other investments like the equity units, common assets, extended market, international balance units, those have to be sold and liquidated and then rolled over as cash. There's no tax implications with that, but you have to sell everything, move that over to an IRA. If you have any shares that you do not declare NUA on, and you want to just hold on to those shares, you can move those shares in kind, move them over to a IRA. And again, no tax implications. And then any shares you declare NUA on, those get moved over to a non-retirement account, non-qualified account, whatever you want to call it. I like non-retirement. Non-qualified doesn't mean a lot to most people, but basically it goes into a non-retirement account or a regular brokerage account. And that can be a single joint or trust account. So as an example here, you got 2.5 million. And let's say basically you have you know, about 2.1 million that's not Exxon stock that would all go to an IRA. 
If you had 379 shares you did not declare NUA on, those would go into a regular IRA. And then if you declared NUA on 4,696 shares worth about 429, that would again go into a brokerage account, non-retirement account. All right, so this is gonna get into how we can use the after-tax money. So this is an example of uh, basically 6,452 shares it has an average cost basis of $29.46. So that's what you pay for it. Again, with pre-tax money, we know that Exxon right now is at about 110, 113, last I looked. And so your cost basis at called about $29.46 times 6,452. What you paid for that is $190,076. So if you did not have after-tax money, this tax paid portion means that after-tax money. Let me just flip back real quick again, just emphasize this, that's this dollar amount here. So let's say you did not have that. When you declare NUA, if you did not have any after-tax money, you would immediately owe taxes on 190,000 as ordinary income taxes. So you're already reporting $190,000 of income declared, you don't have any withholdings or anything, but it's like you made $190,000 extra for the year. So that's also something to keep in mind. If you don't have after-tax money and you're retiring at the end of the year, a lot of times it's good to wait until January to have the cost basis reportable as income, because if you've got almost a full year's worth of salary and you tack on another 190 on that, that's obviously going to uh, hit you harder on the marginal tax rate. You wait until January, you know, just wait a month, declare it then, and then that's falling into a new year where, you know, theoretically you're going to have a lot less overall income. So anyways, cost basis immediately taxable unless you have that after-tax money. So if you have the after-tax money, you can actually apply it to the cost basis, which means that the simplest way to conceptualize this is that that after-tax money flips to pre-tax money. It doesn't disappear. It wouldn't be worth it to apply the after-tax money to the cost basis and the after-tax money goes away. Um, sorry, got another question here. The voice statement has a line of balance source as general account. Is that also before tax? Yes, it is. The general account is company match, which is uh, before tax. Yes. So um, company match is always before tax at this point. There's some law changes that are coming down the road where company match may be raw basis, but that's I think a few years down the road, but yes, general account company match pre-tax or before tax. Um, so sorry, the after-tax money again can be applied to the cost basis. And so what happens to this $187,000 of tax paid portion or after-tax money is that it flips to pre-tax money, it doesn't go away, but now this money is pre-tax. So down the road, you'll pay taxes on it or if you want to get it into a Roth, you can do Roth conversions. But now you can control when you pay taxes on it, which is usually the better way to go, as opposed to having $190,000 of income immediately reported. You can apply this to the cost basis. And then because the one dollars does doesn't quite cover all $190,000, you still have a taxable portion, which is the delta between these two. So declaring anyway, you report an extra $3,000 of income for the year. You had a 35% tax rate, that's about a thousand bucks. So much better than reporting 190. Then this after-tax money is pre-tax money, rolled over to an IRA, convert it down the road or draw it down the road and pay taxes later as opposed to taxes now. Uh, sorry, just scroll down a little bit. Will these slides be made available after the call or on your website? Yes, I can uh, send these taxes out or these uh, slides out to anybody that wants it. Just uh, shoot me a note. I'll leave my email in the chat here. And uh, shoot me a note and I can send these to you. All right, so moving on, whoops, moving on to our example here or with our example here. So let's look at the capital gains as far as when being sold. So if you've got 6,452 shares at a price of $100 per share, that's a total value of $645,200. The taxable cost basis is 190,000. So that's what you paid for it. So that's already been taxed more or less by declaring NUA and applying the after-tax money to it, or you know the taxes are being avoided here. But that's what your basis is. So the delta between the 190 and the 645 is your gains. Most people are going to fall in a 15% tax bracket when it comes to capital gains. So if you were to sell all this stock 
at a 15% capital gain, you're looking at $68,269 in taxes. So that's with using NUA. Now, let's say that you basically, um, what the net proceeds are with NUA, what you're going to pocket, you got the tax paid money um, or the cost basis taxes, which are about $1,000 coming back. That's from this, applying the uh, after-tax money to the cost basis and having about $3,000 of income, owing 1000 bucks there. And then we've got the tax paid on the capital gain. Again, that's just looking at your cost basis, your total value, and the capital gain at a 15% rate, 68269 So these are the taxes owed. After you pay your taxes, you're pocketing $575,870 in this example. Now, let's say you took that same amount of money out without doing any way. You take out, you sell all the stock, you take it out at $100 per share. You've got a value of $645,200. And that's going to put you at the 35% rate. That's going to be taxes of $225,820. So what you're walking away with in this case is $419,380. So basically, if you look at the net proceeds with NUA versus what you're walking away with without NUA, the delta or the benefit of utilizing NUA is $156,490, not insignificant. Uh, I think I got another question here. Let me scroll down. Uh, please discuss how net investment income tax could affect the long-term capital gains rate if you sell NUA stock 3.8%. Okay, yeah, so that's just basically, let me come back to the 3.8%. The uh, sorry, just go back to the capital gains rates. So basically, I forget off the top of my head, if you have over, I want to say about 550 or 600,000 as far as the... Obama, this is the Obamacare surtax, is that 3.8%. It's basically just an additional tax on top of the capital gains rates there. All right, so let's go to where we were. All right, so here's the things to consider as far as favoring more NUA versus less NUA. So what favors more NUA is that the Exxon share price has risen or will rise in the future. We all know that Exxon has had a really good time of it recently. Um, you plan to use the NUA sooner, meaning that you're going to use the cash sooner. You need a big purchase. You're going to put a down payment on a home. You're going to put in a pool, or you just want to you know, shore up your living expenses for the first few years. The idea of NUA is that you spend the money down. Um, that you're retiring before 59 and a half. So between 55 to 59 and a half, you can utilize NUA as a bridge. And if you expect to have RMD issues later, if you declare NUA and move that stock out, that's not going to be part of your required distributions because that money has been moved over to a non-retirement account or a brokerage account, again, non-qualified account, and that is not subject to required distributions. Factors that favor less NUA. If you think that Exxon share prices are going to fall in the future, if Exxon gets back down to 35, obviously you're not getting any benefit if it drops like a rock, you know, after declaring NUA. Or if you don't plan to sell the NUA shares, because there are some tax ramifications with that. Um, it's taxable when it's paying dividends and things like that. It doesn't make sense to declare NUA, sell the stock, pay capital gains taxes, not use the money, reinvest it. You can sell the stock and reinvest it within an IRA or within the 401k without actually incurring any taxes at the point of sale, or if you have a preference for the after-tax money to move into a Roth. But I'll say again, you can always do a Roth conversion and kind of do the same thing, but have a little bit of control over when and how you pay the taxes. So here's a little bit more about the advantages and disadvantages. So advantages of any way, again, it's taxed at a long-term capital gains rate. If you take away anything from this seminar, it's that. NUA is taxed at long-term capital gains rates, not subject to the RMD rules, never subject to a 10% penalty tax. So you can take it out at any point and not pay any early withdrawal penalties. And it can offset the tax on cost, and you can offset the taxes on the cost basis with the tax paid down. So if you have enough after-tax money, you don't have to worry about paying taxes on the cost basis at the point of declaring NUA. What are the disadvantages? Again, the cost basis is taxed at ordinary income rates at the point that you declare NUA, 
if you don't have any after-tax money to offset that, and let's say your cost basis is three hundred thousand, then that's three hundred thousand dollars at the point of declaring anyway that you're having to basically report. Um, there's no benefit of tax deferral on any future growth. So what that means is that anything you earn on that going forward is immediately taxable. One of the beautiful things about 401ks and retirement accounts is that as they grow, you defer to the taxes. So you have that compounding interest effect, any dividends paid out, any gains realized, no taxes on that when the 401k and to withdraw the money. Not the case with the non-retirement account, any gains, dividends, interest, as mentioned before, are immediately taxable in the year it's realized, irregardless of whether you use the money or not. So disadvantages, significant amount of employer stock leads to a less diversified portfolio. So if you're thinking, okay, if you have all your 401k in Exxon stock, you know, one stock, whether it's Exxon, Apple, or otherwise, having too much in one stock can be risky. Less diversification, not usually the ideal. So diversifying out of Exxon stock especially if you have a long way to go until retirement, might be more beneficial for you than, to than holding on to the Exxon stock for the purposes of tax savings for any way. But again, everyone, every situation is different as far as time frame to retirement, how much stock you got, how much you paid for that stock, all that stuff. And again, disadvantage is the dividends are taxed at qualified dividend rates every year. So if you're not using the dividend for cash flow, the dividends are still going to be taxable to you whenever they pay out. Now they're taxed at a qualified dividend rate, which is still 15% better than a dividend rate where it pays out in the 401k and then you take it out. That's taxed at ordinary income. So dividends, if you're using them, are actually taxed at a better rate with NUA shares than not. All right. So <clears throat> that's kind of the gist around NUA. We're going to talk a little bit more about some other pre-retirement strategies as far as, you know, always want to look at how you're saving in your 401k. Um, always going to pull up a statement or check on Boy's website, or if you're with another company, you know, check on your employer website to see how are you saving? Are you saving on a pre-tax, after-tax, or a Roth basis? Um, when you're looking at NUA, take a look at the cost basis and see what the tax paid amount is. Now, it's kind of hard to add up all the cost basis with you know every single share there. We have a way of doing that. We can run an NUA analysis. So anybody that would like to you know kind of take us up on this complimentary service, we do. We can run an NUA analysis, see what your cost basis is in line with your after-tax money, and just you know how much of a NUA benefit you may have. Of course, always consider saving more. And then before you sell any Exxon stock, consider before you sell any low cost shares. Now the Voya plan typically will, if you put in a, a sale for Exxon stock, it'll start at the most expensive shares and work its way down as it should. But be careful when you're selling any Exxon stock, you definitely don't wanna sell low cost shares and keep high cost shares. You wanna keep the low cost shares, sell the high cost shares if you are gonna sell anything or consider that at least. All right, so a little bit more that we're going to get into uh, for post-retirement strategies, tax strategy, which is really what this is all about, cash flow strategy, which is in line with, you know, when you retire, where am I going to pull my money from? 401k, my pension, NUA, savings account. Um, we're going to talk about when you do have a stock, you know, how do you sell it? And we're also going to talk about a covered call strategy, which is utilizing options around a concentrated position of stock. Uh, let me just check to make sure I don't have any other questions that came through. Oh, okay, got another one. If you keep your VOIA account active post-retirement, if you then liquidate, say you are now 62, can you do anyway at that time? As long as you have not pulled any money out of VOIA after you retired, yes, you can do anyway at 62. The criteria for that is that no distributions from VOIA prior to doing anyway. So you can retire at 59 and a half, not touch VOIA, and then at 62, you can do NUA. But if you took money out at 60 and then try and do NUA at 62, you're not going to be able to do it. All right, so a little bit more about cash flow. Like, where are you going to get your cash flow? So in the hierarchy, savings accounts are usually going to be the most tax efficient. Um, it's also going to be, you know, where you've got to build up it's something that's liquid, no penalties. You can get to it at any point. Now, I'm not a big fan of spending down all your savings and then just having investment accounts. But I prefer to have a cushion, emergency fund, 
you know, whatever that is, as far as, you know, six months worth of living expenses, a year's worth of living expenses, just there for those unexpected things. So I don't like spending down savings accounts, but if you got a big, you know, excess in savings, kind of a good way to go to start. Anyway, is a early retirement amount or early retirement asset that you can draw on without taxes, penalties, or excuse me, without penalties, there will be taxes, but without penalties, Another way to get um, income if you're retiring early at 59 and a half, part-time consulting. The 401k, let me talk to that. This is uh, could be its own seminar, but <clears throat> there's something called the rule of 55, which means that if you retire from a company in the year you turn 55 or later, you can actually pull money directly from VOIA. You'll still have ordinary income taxes or directly from your 401k. You'll still have ordinary income taxes, but you won't get hit with that 10% early withdrawal penalty. It's called the rule of 55. The problem with VOIA is that it only allows you to pull money from VOIA once a year. So it makes budgeting a little bit difficult. You pull all your year's worth of expenses in January, you come to October and you need some more money. You can't get any more until you basically come into the new year. And it's per calendar year on that, meaning that if you take money from VOIA in November, you'll be able to take another chunk of money out of VOIA in January. So it's every new year or at the start of the year, you can pull more money out but that is a bridging strategy as well. Now, the thing to keep in mind with the 401k plan is that if you take that money and roll it over to an IRA, let's say at the age of 56, and then you start pulling money from that IRA, there are some exceptions to this, but most of the time, you're then going to get hit with that 10% early withdrawal penalty. So a lot of times for our clients, if they retire prior to 59 and a half, 56, 57, and they don't have any NUA stock or Exxon stock that we can utilize to bridge, we're going to want to keep that 401k there so that we can use that to bridge. Even though we're only drawing once a year, it's still better than paying that 10% penalty. Now, another option is what's called a 72T. That's a bit of a complex thing, but you can set up basically a five-year annuity from an IRA that'll either pay to 59 and a half or for five years, whichever is longer. And that's a way to avoid a 10% penalty. You need a CPA to put that all together for you. It's a bit, it's a very complex thing to do. Try and avoid that as, unless it's a last ditch resort. But that is a way to avoid a penalty. Uh, but a lot of times we can utilize other things and not get into the 72 T because if you mess that up at all, you're going to get clobbered with taxes and penalties on that. And it's very restrictive. And then another way is to get a line of credit. Now, this was a lot better of a strategy or much uh, a much more attractive strategy a few years ago, a couple of years ago, when interest rates were much lower than they are today. You know, lines of credit, of course, now we all know what this interest rate environment's at. I think I may have gotten another question. If you choose rule of 55 or 72T, then NUA strategy can't be used. Uh, rule of 55, no, because basically if you pull money from VOIA utilizing the rule of 55, Another qualifying event will be at 59 and a half. So once you reach 59 and a half, that's another qualifying event and you'll be able to do anyway at that point. So yes, actually you can use 55 and 59 and a half for anyway. So you can actually do both. Now 72T only has to do with IRAs. So if you have an IRA and you basically set up a 72T with that, that's not really gonna affect what goes on with the 401k. So you can still use 72T on the IRA and then anyway, on the 401k, basically. All right. And so this is talking a little bit about taxes and cash flow strategy. So really, you know, where you're generating income, taxability on certain things um, are obviously not all equal. So with Social Security, that is partially taxable as ordinary income. Up to 85% is the maximum of how much can be taxed at ordinary income. So save some taxes on Social Security. Pension income, all that's taxed as ordinary income, whether it's annuity or you're drawing money from the lump sum. Interest income, taxes ordinary income. IRA and 401k distributions, taxes ordinary income. Dividend income, qualified dividends are at long-term capital gains rates. And then long-term capital gains, Again, long-term capital gains rates if sold within a year or, or excuse me, after a year or when declaring anyway. Roth IRAs, love this, no taxes, not subject to taxation. Again, past 59 and a half and the first money that went in there has been in there for at least five years. And then investment principal, 
whatever you put in there as far as non-retirement accounts, basically, you know, you don't get double tax. If you put $100,000 and buy a stock, it goes up to $150. You only owe taxes on the $50 or excuse me, $50,000 worth of gains, not the $100,000 you put in there. So considerations for minimizing tax liability, hold assets that generate interest income in qualified accounts or retirement accounts. Those are accounts that whenever the income is earned, you don't pay taxes. You only pay taxes when you take money out. Qualified accounts, again, think retirement accounts. Hold assets generating dividends or capital gains in non-retirement accounts or non-qualified accounts. So again, qualified dividends, long-term capital gains, that can all be held in, in non-retirement accounts and tax at a better rate. <clears throat> Use distributions from different account types and different assets. So typically don't want to do all or none. I don't like just draining out all the non-retirement accounts in five years and all we have are retirement accounts. What if you know five years down the road, you do decide to buy a house, you need $500,000. If all we got is retirement accounts, then we're getting $500,000 of extra income for the year on top of what we need to take out for those just basic living expenses. So I always like to keep some non-retirement money aside for some potential future expenses that we may not even realize we're gonna do at this stage. Um, withdraw qualified assets before required to reduce future tax bills. So that's just basically, if you're gonna to get to the point where you have a lot of retirement accounts, you could get to the point where when you're taking your required distributions, they're forcing you to take out more than you actually need to spend. So you can pay some taxes earlier on Roth conversions or just take some money out and, you know, live a little bit more. And that's going to save you on taxes potentially down the road. Plus, we know what tax rates are today. Who knows what tax rates will be when we're all 75. Focus on maximizing lifetime after tax income instead of minimizing current tax bills. So what I see a lot of times is people uh, get, for lack of a better phrase, uh, penny wise, pound foolish. So don't want to only focus on how much am I saving on taxes this year. Look at it more on the long term, because on the long term, saving taxes this year might benefit, or you could save taxes this year, but cost you taxes in the long run. Well, we always want to focus on the long term. All right. So this is just, again, showing the long-term capital gains rates. And I think this is the question we got about the 3.8. So this is the ranges as far as if you have no other income and you have long-term capital gains and qualified dividends, you can see up to about 89,000 is not taxed. You get to this range, you're at 15, this range 15 plus a surtax, and then over this 20 plus a surtax. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what are called good till canceled orders. So one of the benefits of moving stock out of an employer plan or a 401k plan is how you can liquidate that stock, buy or sell it. Uh, within Voya, whenever you try and sell Exxon stock, you get the next day's price at whatever the average price is, and that's still not crystal clear, but basically you're never gonna know what you're selling it at. Exxon, as we can see this year, has moved quite a bit, uh, moved quite a bit last year, pops up to 119, only to drop down to 100, or I think even below that to the 90s this year. So one of the things you can do to liquidate Exxon stock in a brokerage account or a IRA is set a limit order or a good till cancel order. <clears throat> so let's say if Exxon gets up to 119, you're ready to sell it. You don't want to be having to check the market or the stock every single day or every single hour. Instead of doing that, you can set a limit order that says if Exxon gets up to 119, sell 25% of it, 50% of it, 1,000 shares, 500 shares, whatever. And you can set that price, keep it good till canceled. And if Exxon gets up to 119, it's getting sold. Now, you don't get locked in with that. You can change it. You can say, okay, it doesn't seem like it's going to get back up to 119. I'm going to lower it down to 113 or whatever. Um, but it is a way that you can set it and kind of forget it as far as that goes. So that's a consideration when it comes to how to diversify out of Exxon stock. Then there's covered call strategies. Now, this is a little bit more of a complex topic as far as utilizing what are called options on a concentrated position or a single stock. So there's four factors to look at <clears throat> with a covered call, and I'll get into these. There's what's called the strike price, the time frame the premium, and then the underlying stock. In this case, we're focusing a lot on Exxon. So 
Intuitively, what a covered call strategy is, is basically when a stock investor sells what's called a call option against their shares, what they are doing is accepting a premium or the what's called the option premium as payment for giving up all upside potential in the shares above the strike price. That'll make a little bit more sense when I show an example here. In other words, by selling a call option against 100 shares of Exxon stock, you are selling the profit potential on the shares above the strike price of the call you sell. So a little bit more of a simplistic way to put it. If you sell an option strategy against a, a stock, you are giving someone the right to buy it at a certain price. So if you say, okay, I'm going to sell this option strategy for the right to buy Exxon at 120, Exxon gets up to 130, then you are basically, you have to sell it at 120. So what the person who buys that or, sell, or buys that option from you is hoping for, Exxon is going to go up significantly and they buy it at a discount and then turn around and sell it. So here's a little bit more of an example. And this gets into those definitions of those four items. So premium is the dollar you receive, meaning that that's what someone will pay you for the right to buy Exxon at a certain price. And this example is $5 per share. The strike price is the agreed upon sales price you're willing to sell it at. So when you talk about a call or an option, one call equals 100 shares, 10 calls equal 1,000 shares. So if you sell basically... 1,000 shares at $5 a premium, Five dollars they'll pay you $5 per share for the right to buy Exxon from you at 120, you're immediately making $5,000. Now that premium is immediately collected. You get it as soon as they buy it from you. There's a time frame that the option has until it expires. So there's two outcomes that are gonna come from this. The stock is either gonna be at $120 at the point or under at the point it expires, so basically you collect the premium, you still hold on to the stock, you've gotten the dividend over this entire time because again, you still own the premium. And then the second option is gonna be the stock is over $120 on expiration date, which means that typically they're gonna buy that stock from you. Now, if it's only at $121, they're not gonna buy it from you because they paid $5 per share. So typically it's gonna have to get at least above 125. So here's an example again. If you've got basically the um, stock at 105 and you sell an option at $5 per share, the stock goes up to 130, it's probably going to get called away. You sold it at 120. Now you got a $5 premium. So you still make your $120. You've made $5 in premiums. So technically 125, because again, it's $5 per share. And then what you missed out at, if Exxon gets up to 130, is $5 per share. That's the opportunity cost you can miss out on. Another thing to consider when it comes to um, option strategies is that getting that premium is a way to kind of juice up the dividend. So if you're not really looking to sell the Exxon stock, but you want to get some more dividend out of it, you can write some covered calls, kind of stretch the price up a little bit higher. Now, the higher the price, as far as the strike price that you're willing to sell it at, the less they're going to pay you for that. But you, know, you can get maybe a dollar per share, $2 per share, whatever it is and get that premium immediately paid for you. Hope that doesn't go up if you don't want to sell it. And then just have a short window of time that that option expires, basically. Now there's risk with that. It still could get called away, but you know you set the price high enough, <clears throat> probably not going to be too upset if you're selling Exxon at 130. <clears throat> All right, so this is just an example of call options. So this shows what the strike price is, meaning what you're willing to sell it at. If it's in blue, it means it's in the money, meaning that's already at 105. This bid and ask is basically what the premiums are going for. So you can see that the higher you go, the lower the premium is. So up to 130 is $2.47. But at the time, I don't know where, where Exxon was at when this was ran, but at 110, people were willing to pay $8.37. So not too bad per share. All right. So Pros and cons of covered call strategies. The advantages is that you earn additional income while holding on to the stock. There's a little bit of downside protection. And really what the downside protection is listed as is here is that you get the premium. You get that paid immediately. So if Exxon goes to zero, you at least got your premium. Very unlikely, but uh, that's that. It's a great strategy to divest shares. So, you know, it's a way to get some extra money if you do want to sell it at a certain price. So if you can get your price and your premium too, it's win-win. 
disadvantages. Again, it caps the upside profit. If X people were, you know, writing options at $80, you know, before Exxon took off and then got up to, you know, however high it got up to 119. That's a, you know, pretty big gap. That if you just held the stock and sold it, you would have been better than what you collected in premiums. Again, it may require you to sell the stock if you change your mind and you're in that option. You know, you can buy it back, but there's some um, losses you'll probably realize with that. So you'll, you know, be forced to sell the stock in many cases. And again, the downside protection is just limited to the premium received. All right, so that's pretty much the gist of the seminar. I think I had another question come through, but all this to be said, we invite you to, especially if you have Exxon stock, a significant portion in your 401k plan, and you're considering retirement in the near term, anyway, can be a great strategy to look at. The longer your time frame till retirement, the less NUA becomes appealing because who knows what Exxon prices, Exxon's price is going to be in the next 10, 15, 20 years or any stock for that matter. But if you are close to retirement within a year or two or three, I would say, NUA is certainly something you want to consider looking at before you know selling off your Exxon stock. So we invite you to take us up on a one-on-one -on -one complimentary financial strategy session. We can look at NUA, retirement planning, how you're saving your 401k and all the other holistic planning stuff that we like to do. You can go to our website and contact us. So you can put in your name, email address, and we'll reach out to you and get you set up with either myself or one of our advisors. So thank you for coming. I'm going to type my email in here just uh, for anybody that would like the slides or just wants to reach out to me directly. I oops, let me actually put it in for everybody. So there's my email. If everyone can see that, feel free to shoot me an email. If you have questions you weren't comfortable asking in front of the group, if you want the slides, shoot me an email and I'll send it to you. And, um, or if you wanna reach out to me directly to set up some time, happy to do that. So let me see, I think I had a couple other questions. I'm very familiar with covered call, but does Bogart have a recommendation for strike prices and expiration dates? Uh, it depends on where the Exxon stock is. Off the top of my head, don't have one just right off the top of my head, but has to do with risk tolerance, kind of what the goals are and things like that. So we just kind of look at where it's at, where the premiums are at at the time, and just you know come up with a strategy on that piece. And then uh, with Exxon stock, uh, yeah, I'm assuming that was around the covered call strategies. Yeah, you can use that with Exxon stock if it's not at VOIA, if it's in an IRA or a non-retirement account, you can use these option strategies with Exxon stock. Oh, I'm sorry. That was actually a follow-up with the same question. Yeah, don't have an exact recommendation on strike prices right at this moment. We'd have to look at that a little bit more detail. Who is actually writing these call options? Um, that would be basically, so if you're writing the call option, that would be you. So you actually sell the call option and then the person on the other end would buy it from you. And cover call options, I think it's important to hide. You have to be retired as an Exxon employee to do this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Olaf. That's a very good point. Thanks for emphasizing that. With uh, options, Exxon, if you're still employed there, don't do that. You can't do it. Exxon does not allow you to do that. So do not do any covered call options or options. Most people understand that. But again, if you don't know that, don't do that. Um, you cannot do any option strategies with Exxon unless you are no longer with the company. So you have to be retired or separated from service before you consider doing options. Thank you, Olaf. That's a very good point. All right. That is the deck here. And just some disclosures. But thank you for your time. And I'll stay in here for just a couple more moments and see if there's any other questions. <clears throat> All right, so I think that is all the questions. Again, uh, if you can see my email there, um, it's also on the website, email and phone numbers there. Feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any questions or would like the copy of the decks. Uh, just reach out to me directly and I'll send it to you. And this will also be posted on our website. So we'll have a recording of this webinar posted on our website probably in the next week or two. So um, if you want to listen to it again, feel free to go to our website and it'll be there. All right, so I think that's everything. Don't see any other questions coming through. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I see people dropping out of the Zoom. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great week. And again, thanks for the time.